My name is Julian. Anybody? I'm an editor at Random House, and I'm thrilled to uh, be here talking to these two brilliant authors. Of course, I, I think they're brilliant because I have the pleasure of publishing both of them. So this will be a chance for me to ask them some uh, questions I don't normally get to ask. Uh, and I figure we'll talk for 20 minutes or so and maybe try and squeeze in some, uh, some Q&A from, from you all at the end. But uh, first, just to do the proper introductions, um, to my right here is Rob Art, who is the author of The Warehouse, which is to be published by Crown in August. It looks like that. Please pre-order a copy. Um, Rob is the author of the Ash McKenna Crime series and the short story collection Takeout. He also co-wrote Scott Free with James Patterson. He's worked as a book publisher, a political reporter, and a communications director for a politician and was a commissioner for the city of New York. He lives on Staten Island. And then on my other side here is Blake Crouch, author of Recursion, which is to be published by Crown in 10 days, is that right? Yeah, but we're not counting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not counting down at all. Uh, Blake is a novelist and a screenwriter. His novels include the New York Times bestseller Dark Matter and the uh, internationally bestselling Wayward Pines trilogy, which was adapted into a television series that some of you might know. Uh, he also co-created the TNT show Good Behavior, which was based on his Letty Debesh novellas. And he's here today from Colorado. So, uh, so we're supposed to be talking about big ideas here, uh, and I think probably the best starting point is uh, for each of you to sort of briefly describe the big idea at the center of your novel. So I'll let whoever wants to start. Uh, so the central conceit of recursion is, well, let me, let me back up. When I sat down to start writing this novel, I, I wanted to do something big on an even bigger scale than I had uh, tackled with Dark Matter. And so I started asking myself, well, what is the most precious thing we own? And I, came, I kept coming back and back to the concept of memory. Because if you take our memories away, you remove our identity. And there's some pretty mind-blowing science out there that says if you take that memory is actually the thing that creates reality. And once I, I came across a few of these uh, articles about some scientists implanting false memories in the brains of mice and wondering what if we could implant false memories in our brains? What if we could manipulate memory in such a way that our past could be in a, in a state of constant flux? Um, so recursion is based on this notion of memory, how it defines us, and what happens if you start messing with it. Over to you. So uh, what, what, what's really fun about the warehouse is I really can trace it back to one specific moment. Uh, I was reading this article in Mother Jones about uh, online retailer fulfillment centers, like the kind of place where when you order something online, someone has to pick it off a shelf and put it in the bin and get it sent to you and just how absolutely terrible the conditions were that they had these algorithms that you couldn't really keep up with that the work conditions were kind of brutal, that it was hard to even take bathroom breaks, and yet still people were lined up around the block for these jobs because they were jobs in, in economically depressed areas where people were struggling to find employment. And, and it really, I, the article came out in like 2013 and it hit me like a bolt. Like what if there was just one company that kind of completely took over the American retail economy and built these giant warehouses where you had to work there, but then you also had to live there, so you're basically always working. And that was, that was it. Like, that was, that, was the end, that was the end stage of capitalism. And I, I scribbled it down on a post-it note. And uh, recently, uh, I, I left my job, and, and the person who took it over was clearing out the desk, and they found that note. And uh, so I told them to hold on to it, and I kept it. And it's... Uh, it really, it was everything kind of sprung out of that one article, and, and it's weird sitting here all these years later and thinking like, oh cool, like it actually had to develop into something. So, yeah, I mean, I'm really curious for both of you when you have an idea like that, which is a sort of a big crazy idea and not necessarily the easiest thing to write, do you, do you know that there is a novel in it? Do you see the whole book ahead of you, or do you just sort of jump in and start writing and see if it sustains itself? I think usually when 
you first get those inklings of that big idea, your knee-jerk reaction is like, oh, well, that's stupid. Um, <laughs> it was definitely, uh, that was the case for, uh, for Wayward Pines and, and for sure the case for Dark Matter. Um, and early on in my career, I know that I had a lot of these ideas floating past me and I was probably too reticent to actually take them seriously. And when I, when I finally did take it seriously, and it was, when, it was with Wayward Pines, and I said, I'm just gonna write this, this big stupid thing and it's probably gonna fail, but I, I have to try. Um, and when I took this idea seriously, the, the world opened up for me, at least from a career standpoint. And I, and I realized that one book with a great idea at its core is worth all, and I'd written nine books up to that point. This was worth all those books I had written. It was worth it by a factor of 100 because it, a big idea can communicate to such a broader audience. And it's like once you realize that, and I wrote this, uh, I, I, when I'm writing, I have a writing journal that I usually uh, spend the first few months of my book process scribbling notes and thoughts. and. I, I still have this page and I, I should frame it because I wrote no more small books and I have some friends who, you know, we, we read each other's stuff and it's sort of our mantra, no more small books, no more small ideas because the power of a big idea is the power to reach so many more people. See, I almost start from the opposite point where every time I get a new idea, I'm like, wow, this is brilliant. And I have a, so, so my work process is every time I get an idea that I think has legs, I create a Google Doc for it. And it becomes a repository for like links or, or stray thoughts or fragments. And it's usually not for like sometimes a couple of weeks or a couple of months when I look back at it, I'm like, oh, now I realize that that was intensely stupid. Um, <laughs> So uh, what I find is that there are some ideas uh, in, in that humongous Google Doc file that I have now that I just keep on coming back to. And they're the ones that I can't stop thinking about. And they're the ones that when I read the newspaper, I'm like, oh, this works for the warehouse. This is something that would be relevant for that. So let me dump the link in there so I don't forget. And so uh, it, it becomes this game of, of what is the thing that I just keep going back to over and over again. And, and it's the ones that won't leave me alone that I finally realize like, oh yes, this is a good idea because I, I literally am obsessing about it now. Uh, actually, so a question about the warehouse, Rob, something I, I have really been wondering about. Um, you make such great non-obvious choices with the three main characters, the three narrators. And they are sort of so perfectly representing um, all of the all of the arguments of the novel, I guess, all the viewpoints of the novel. Was um, was arriving at, at those three narrators? Was that sort of like the, the, the point at which you you felt like you'd cracked you'd cracked how to tell the story? Yeah, uh, it was actually it was that third narrative voice. It, it was Gibson. Uh, so the story is told from three perspectives. It's uh, Paxton, who is sort of like a rank and file worker there, who is a security guard and is not really happy to be working there. Uh, Zinnia, who is a picker in their warehouse, but is also a corporate spy and may or may not be using Paxton to gain access. And then there's also sort of uh, this overarching, uh, it's told mostly through blog posts, the, the CEO of this company, uh, Gibson Wells, who's like a messianic, like Steve Jobs-like figure. And this is a book that I kept on poking at for years and years, and it was just never clicking. And the problem was is that with Paxton, you know, he's kind of a company man. Zinni is a little bit more questioning and a little bit more acerbic, but there, there needed to be that voice to sort of ground the company and, and kind of give the company's point of view. So uh, really what it was is I read Sam Walton's autobiography. Uh, a lot of my research in this book was into Walmart because Walmart's been around since the 60s, so you can see how that company has grown from like this little nothing thing to this economy-changing behemoth. And Walton's autobiography is fascinating because he's such a down-home guy who like talks about family and, and, and how important family is and how all those employees are his family. And this is the same guy who broke up his company when the federal minimum wage law was passed so that he wouldn't have to pay any of his employees the minimum wage, which does not sound like a very familial thing to do. But when I, when, when I read that and I was like, oh, like, if I can also tell the story from the other perspective and kind of show you what it's like to build that company, 
now it kind of makes sense. So it was, it was once I, that was really sort of the entry point for me. Like once I had that, I was like, okay, cool. Now I think I could write this book. So, and, and Blake, actually a similar question for you because recursion has some, uh, you made some, some difficult and surprising choices with the, the POVs in that book. And it's hard to talk too much about that without being spoilery, but uh, it starts from, from two separate POV characters who then their stories come together in a very surprising and cool and sort of delightful way. Uh, and it's, a, it's, it's a, a way into telling a very complicated story. Was that, was that also, was that sort of figuring out where to join those two narrators and how to bring them together? Was that, was that the trick to, to getting into it? I think it was. Um, I had written these separate POVs, one from Helena, who is this neuroscientist trying to develop this chair that can let us relive and re-experience in a very vivid, immersive way our most precious memories. It's because her mom's dying of Alzheimer's. She wants to preserve her mom's core memories. And then I had this character of Barry Sutton, who is this detective, 10 years out from a divorce, and also had dealing with the grief from the loss of his daughter 10 years prior. And I had both of these really kind of sad sack characters. And I think one of the things I was struggling with early on in writing the book is like, man, I'm just, this is bleak. This is just, I'm t I don't wanna hang out with these guys. And I realized kind of a little ways into the book that what, what they really needed was each other and they needed to meet. And I think at the very beginning, I was never contemplating these two characters' paths crossing. And once they started sharing scenes, and once they started sharing a bed, I realized that I just found this real energy to explode the back half of the book as they are racing desperately to try to stop the repercussions of this chair that Helena has built that is kind of unmaking the reality that we all think we're experiencing. Um, so it's funny, and every time I'm struggling with a book, I often think the problem is the plot, but it, I always realize at the end it's, it's something that's off with the character and with the character motivations, and it's, there's something I'm missing and something I'm not uh, paying enough credence to. And I went, when I realized that with recursion, it suddenly opened up for me. And I will say for many of you who haven't, haven't read recursion yet, the, the moment when these two characters meet is like so cool, it's such a cool, amazing, surprising reveal. Uh, and yeah, the book really takes off from there. Um, speaking of, of bleak though, Blake, um, <laughs> we, we were joking uh, on the phone the other day, I think, about how somehow you always end up destroying the world in your novels. Um, <laughs> why, do you think, why do you think that, uh, that sort of that trope appeals? What, 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 is, what brings you there? I don't know, maybe it's because I just, see us inevitably heading there anyway. Um, and I think some of the stories that I write, you know, there's this idea that tomorrow is closer than we think. Um, and it's, it's the technology that is so consuming our lives and augmenting our behavior that is leading us into this future. And this future could be one of a utopia or it could be a dystopia or it could be, you know, ashen and cinders. And what really makes me want to dig in on a story is, is looking at how someone who develops a piece of technology that has the power to either be, to change our lives for the better or to destroy our lives and how they wrestle with that. And I, and I love that, A, from a standpoint of, I think it, it lends itself to really exciting storytelling, but also I, I think it's, really what we as a species need to be thinking about in this moment with looking at things like CRISPR with gene editing technology and the emergence of strong artificial intelligence. Um, these are going to be questions that are going to be screamed louder and louder and louder in our ears with every year that, that goes past. And we have to get our arms around how we deal with creating something that has the power to destroy us. So that actually uh, leads, I think, very well to the warehouse in a way, because, Rob, you are describing a near-future dystopia 
that is um, very much based in present day technology and politics and um, feels, feels really plausible. I mean, I guess my first question is, do you really, are you presenting it as this sort of exaggerated, fictionalized warning, or do you really think like we are, we are heading there, we are potentially heading to the, to the place that you describe? I mean, to my mind, we're kind of already there in a large sense. Uh, you know, the book is about how, you know, corporations are gobbling each other up and becoming these massive monopolies and how those monopolies then get to rewrite tax laws and, and you know, the, the American worker has been devalued to the point where, you know, we're almost disposable products to large companies. So, you know, it doesn't so much feel like fiction to me sometimes, which is, I guess, kind of the bummer. Um, but I, I, I very specifically wanted everything in this book to feel just very familiar. I, I wanted, I wanted, because I think part of the problem we have I, I, is an empathy gap where, where, you know, this is a system we've bought into. We've decided our own comfort is more important than someone else's discomfort. So I thought there was a way to just basically take everything we have now and kind of tweak it a little bit. Uh, but really, you know, even in terms of live work facilities, like in the warehouse, that's what Foxconn does. You know, that's where they build our iPhones in facilities where you, you work there and you live there and they pay you nothing and you work like 12 hours a day, seven days a week and the conditions are deplorable. So it's, it's, it's almost just moving that business model over to the US. Um, and I think uh, just a, a last couple questions for me and then, and then we'll, we'll go to, to you. Um, but Blake, one thing I've always wondered about with recursion is you described the starting point as memories make reality as sort of your jumping off, but then, and it's, it's hard to talk about recursion without spoilers, but um, you then make a jump to playing that concept out in a way that we do not expect at all. Um, did, that, did that extra piece of it come for you right away, or was that something that sort of surprised you as, as you dug into it? Uh, sadly and tragically, it did not come right away. Um, <laughs> my first draft, I don't have to tell you, uh, was not really making the most of the concept. I think of the, like, I think of the concept that is central to a book as like a, an engine in a car. And I think that the idea of being able to return to our memories and exploring how memory creates reality is like, that's a Ferrari engine. And I was just, I was like puddling along at like 60 miles an hour um, throughout my first draft of the novel. And I, and I think I knew that on a subconscious level that I didn't quite realize until I had hit send and the manuscript was off <laughs> to uh, the editor's inbox. Um, and you know, we had a lot of conversations and I did a lot of uh, soul searching and I, and I realized I, this idea is, I, I need to be a little more wild and, and reckless with it. I need to like take this engine up to like 200. I need to redline it. Uh, so this ended up with me throwing out half of the book at, at the midpoint and completely redoing it and, and taking what I had built up to that point and then just putting a rocket booster on it. Uh, and it was a very uh, kind of frustrating, demoralizing process. It sadly seems to be my process. <laughs> um, but it was well worth the, uh, the effort for me and I hope for you guys. Yeah, I mean, it was uh, pretty incredible seeing how, how fearless you were about just diving into that other version of the book that really, that really blew it out for readers and, and really sort of ties back to what you're saying about no, no small books. Like you really are committed to pushing yourself and going there. Uh, and yeah, when people read, read Recursion, they will know exactly uh, how much pain you went through making, making it all work. <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, so just a last, uh, a last question for me, uh, just putting you both on the spot a little bit. Um, what, what would you want readers to, to take away from, from your book, from, from the warehouse, Rob? I mean, I, I don't know that there are any answers in there, but if people were to start asking questions, that would be super cool. Um, you know, I, I talked a little bit before about the empathy gap uh, and thinking a little bit more about that. and and. I, I just want to say about the dedication real quick. I dedicated it to a woman uh, named Maria Fernandez. She worked at three Dunkin' Donuts part-time uh, because presumably none of them wanted to give her benefits. 
and she would have to sleep in a car between shifts, and she died. Uh, a gas can overturned, and she suffocated. And she was struggling to pay $550 a month on a basement apartment in Newark. And that same year, the CEO of Duncan Brands made $10 million. And, and that's unconscionable, you know. Uh, but, but this is sort of, this is the system that we've bought into where, where workers like Maria just kind of get overlooked. So uh, if this could maybe become a starting point for people to think about their impact, uh, their, their economic footprint, I, that wouldn't be so bad. I, what, the thing I'm doing lately with my books comes out of my own research into emerging technologies, into science. I sadly found science too late in life. I, I took no science courses in college, um, in one math, only because I had to have it to graduate. And it's, it's really weird that now I spend most of my time thumbing through Scientific American and Nature and the Smithsonian. Um, it's, it's not something so specific to this book, it, what, but what it, I hope that you would take away is that the reality that we all live in and think we know is way weirder and more mysterious and more mind-boggling than we realize. And I hope when you read Dark Matter, I hope when you read Recursion, you just walk away with a different understanding of reality in the world that we live in. Um. Okay, great. Uh, does anyone, anyone out there have any questions for us? If you don't have any questions, I'm just going to ask questions yeah, you, to Julian. You can ask me yeah. questions, yeah. If you don't ask uh, questions, we're going to start questioning yeah. Julian. <laughs> oh, Which go. one of us is your favorite? Uh, oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, all, of, all of my authors are my favorite. Thank you. Um, this question's for Blake. Uh, did you have any uh, particular inspiration for the, uh, the antagonist of um, Recursion? Any particular person in mind that you might have based him loosely off of? Because he felt familiar and I couldn't put a finger on it. Uh, I'll repeat it to make sure I got it. Did I have any specific inspiration for the, uh, the antagonist of recursion? Yeah. Um, I want to be careful because, again, it's very hard to talk about this book without really spoiling things. Uh, the antagonist of this book is... A man reminds me a little of someone like maybe Elon Musk, a young billionaire who, with the arrogance and the audacity and the uh, bank account to think that they can materially change the world, and he wants to rush headlong into that without 100% considering all of the repercussions for the rest of us. So yeah. I, it's, it's uh, yeah, you, know, you, you guys know the type of um, business tycoon who just dabbles enough in science to be dangerous that I'm talking about. He, he could actually be uh, the antagonist in, in the warehouse a little bit, sort of that same, that same type. Yeah. yeah, these guys all kind of have a lot in common, which is they are always the smartest man in the room. Thanks. Uh, so. In the description for the panel today, both of you guys, your, your stories have been optioned. They're going to new places. To what degree have you been invited along to help out with those processes? Uh, so far, uh, we're still kind of at the beginning of the process. So, so Ron Howard optioned the warehouse. Um, and it, it was funny, when, when I had my first phone conversation with them, I haven't spoken to him, but when I was speaking to his people, I was like, look, you know, I get it. You know, you guys are, you, you bought the option, you know, I, I don't want to get in anyone's way. I don't, I don't want to interfere because I'm just excited to be involved. And, and they were like, you know, we don't want you to feel like that way. We, we want you to feel like you're a part of the process, w which was super exciting. Um, and and they, we, we've spitballed about, like, casting ideas, and they've told me who they've got in mind to write the screenplay. So... You know, uh, it, it's, been, it's been a really positive experience thus far, uh, and I say that being so close to the beginning of the experience that there's not even much to report. But uh, it's, it's super cool. Um, Recursion was such a beast of a book to write that when it was time for us to, to take it out and, and try to sell it to Hollywood, I, I did not want to have anything to do with the adaptation. And I, I've been fortunate enough to get to write and executive produce on, on the two shows that I've had made. But this one, I, I just felt like, you know, you guys have fun storming the castle. Um, I, I, want, I want smarter people than I am uh, 
figuring out how to, how to make this work. And it's a very, it's a very big book. I mean, it's not, it's 336 pages in hardcover, but so much stuff happens. And there's no way it's a two hour movie. And there's no way it's also, it just doesn't feel like a TV show. So I was a little nervous going out. Um, then luckily, um, Shonda Rhimes and Matt Reeves, who directed Cloverfield, he's doing the new Batman. They have big deals at Netflix. And they came to me and said, you know, I think we know a way to do this where we'll just, we'll launch it with a movie or two movies on Netflix and then spin it off into television shows. In other words, creating a universe, which oddly is exactly the only way I think justice could be done to recursion. And we're luckily in a time where the lines between film and television are getting really muddy in exciting ways. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. I mean, there's one 30-page sequence in recursion that in itself is a TV series. Like, that's how, how much story there is. No, that's true. There was someone, uh, when I was talking with them on the phone, they mentioned a single line from the book. And they're like, well, we just, we want that to be an entire series. I was like, great, have fun. <laughs> I, I just wanted to say the, uh, with what Rob said, the uh, empathy gap, I see that happening more and more. I work as a pharmacy tech and everything's becoming so automated. So it's like they're going to be decreasing hours for technicians and then like with McDonald's having those automated things. So it's like we're no longer dealing with people. We're dealing with machines. So I can see where you're coming from with the empathy gap. And then for Blake, I love the Wayward Pine series. I wanted to, do you have anything else in the works for their, like, any future books for that, for The Wayward Pines? Will there be a fourth book? I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, look, never, never say never, uh, but I, I really like where I left the last town. I, I love that last line. I think it invites the reader to uh, imagine what comes next. I have not given it a, a, a single thought. <laughs> oh, thank you. Hi, thanks. Um, this really great proposal, uh, no more small books, uh, leads to the hard question. When do you decide your concept is big enough? What's the process there? Can you share the, some of that? Mm. It, it's not just about the concept itself. Uh, you know, you, I could throw off any number of like big ideas right now, like, you know, Mars falls to pieces and comes into orbit with Earth and pieces of it start crashing into our planet and we have to deal with that. I mean, it, that sounds great, but I mean, that's only really half of it. The other part of the concept, which is in a lot of ways harder for me to get at the heart of, is the character emotion. And my, my books tend to be pretty autobiographical in, in that the protagonists I write about, things that they're going through, are direct reflections of what my life has been during the course of writing this book. Now, sometimes I don't realize that until the end, and I'm like, oh, this is what I was writing Dark Matter about, or oh, this is what recursion is really about, because this is, you know, it's sort of writing as, as self-therapy. So it takes those two pieces to, to get going. I mean, this is, just to jump in, as, as an editor, I have very strong opinions about this because I'm sort of on the front lines. I'm seeing like hundreds of manuscripts a year. Uh, and yeah, there's sort of that sense where high concepts can be um, a bit of a four letter word, like it's a bit of a bait and switch sometimes, or someone comes up with like, right, this great idea, it sounds super exciting. It's exciting enough to get you to pick up the book. But then it kind of doesn't deliver on it. It doesn't play it through. And I see that so, so often and the I think one of, one of the many exceptional elements of both of these books is that it's not just the concept. It's you both take the concept and then you attack it head on and sort of exploit all of the possibilities that the reader is enticed by when they see the cover, when they read the pitch. Like you are delivering on all of those elements. Those were good answers. Um, so I agree. Yeah, for me, it's, um, it's, it's I, I, I have lots of weird, crazy ideas, but until you can sort of hang it on uh, s uh, someone's point of view and you can really feel that and, and sort of experience it through their eyes, then, then it's just an idea, you know, like you need to hang it on a character.
Hi, the, um, my question was for Blake. So what really intrigued me was that you were talking about the fact that you do a lot of like research into like scientific journals and like emerging technology. And I think you mentioned you were looking at experiments where science, scientists were implanting false memories in mice. Um, I was actually looking at an experiment where scientists had um, basically deleted mem emotions that were attached to a memory but like it wasn't the memory itself, so it was really interesting. It started me thinking about maybe writing like a narrative about that, where the memory's not necessarily taken away, but the emotions are and what the impact would be. Have you come across any other like experiments or any other science stuff that, that you think might be the next big idea for like another story you wanna write? Yeah, but I can't tell you that, right? <laughs> But you should write that idea. That's that's, that is, that's cool. That is a cool idea. That is a very interesting idea. Um, when I got into like the actual science of of how we manipulate memories, what they, it was these two MIT scientists, and it's happened I think in 2010. And what they did is they figured out which. So all a memory is is a pattern of neurons that fire in our brain. Like say I th think about your eighth birthday. If you can remember it, that's a pattern in your brain. And each time you think about it, it's the same neurons lighting up. Well, these guys just figured out how to artificially fire certain neurons in the brains of mice. So they would trick a mouse into thinking it had been shocked in a little labyrinth. I don't know why we're always shocking and doing terrible things to mice, but this is what we're doing. And, it, and it, it, they would do this and they would fire these neurons and the mouse would freeze because it was having this false memory of being shocked in this labyrinth even though that had never happened. Um, what you're saying about attaching emotion to memory is fascinating. Uh, I, I've not come across that article, but it, you should you should write that. I'm gonna try to. <laughs> Thank Good you. Luck. Hi guys. Um, both of you have books right now with multiple point of view, and I feel like we are coming off of this very long time of just a lot of hero's journey stories where there's that singular protagonist that we're following along. Did you sort of step away from that intentionally by following multiple characters in your story? Because it, it just brings me back to Rob's empathy gap and I feel like that the hero's journey is a little narcissistic for us, that we, we all feel like we have to be that one hero and these stories that have larger, um, like a world to look at can build more of that empathy. So I was just wondering if that was an intentional choice or it's just like your stories and concepts just needed all of those um, pathways to make it clear. Well, do you, you ever see the movie Pacific Rim? where they've got these gigantic robots that are so big that literally one person can't pilot it. They need two people because the neural load is too big. You'll just burn out your brain. It almost feels like that. Like once the story gets that big, it just can't, like, like I just didn't see how I can tell this story through the eyes of one person because there were too many perspectives about this, this company that kind of needed to, to come across. You know, I, I previously had written like a private detective series, and, and that's easy to do from one perspective because that's sort of like a smaller scale, you know, very personal kind of story. Whereas, you know, w once you kind of open up the playground a little bit, it's like you, you, you have this, this uh, burden that you have to shoulder between multiple people. And it really, it, it's something that scared the hell out of me at first because I was like, I don't know how to write more than one voice in a story. And I found that it, it gave me the freedom to sort of play with perspective a little bit and play with time a little bit and play with judgment a little bit. So, you know, something's happening to one character and another character is, is, is interpreting it entirely differently. Uh, I, I found it to be like a fun new sandbox to play in. I love, I love there are moments in the book where you have uh, the male protagonist thinking one thing about an interaction and then you cut straight to Zinnia thinking something very different about him. And those are like some of, some of the, the funniest moments in the book and you get some great mileage out of it. Um, and I also think a lot of The Warehouse, you're, um, you're kind of playing on that hero's journey idea because Paxton is trying to be a hero and doing kind of a terrible job of it for a lot of the book. And it's about whether he can sort of find that, that courage within himself to actually be the hero of the story. Yeah, yeah, it was fun to kind of play with, you know, who's the protagonist, who's the antagonist, and who's the passive observer, and how do we sort of 
move them all into different positions throughout the course of the story. Thanks, guys.